you very much for, for having this conversation with me. I'm very happy and honored to meet you, not personally, but uh, we, we're going to get there someday. Yes, someday I'll be in Brazil. I keep yeah. getting invited. I've yeah. been there before. What, what, what is it need to, to get you in Brazil? Yeah, yeah, you need to get me to Brazil. I love Brazil. Uh, but but what what someone need to have you? What, what I have to do to have you here? You know, lectures, debates, or anything? The simplest, the simplest thing to do is pay me a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm a PhD student. I don't have a lot of money. You know that. How that yeah, works? Well, yeah. Well, you know, find find someone with one with a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let Let's start off. I think you you've been talking in your debates that science is not a is, is a process and uh, I want you to elaborate a little on that and what, what science is all about? Well science is a method for distinguishing fact from fiction for um, uh, to uncover it's a method for asking questions systematically and um, and find ways to answer those questions in a in in a way that you can test so it's very simply a method for, um, based on, and, and this is the other important thing, it's a method based on empirical evidence. So one asks questions about the universe, one tests the universe with empirical questions uh, and, and, and observations, and then one, one uh, either confirms or falsifies something. Now the important thing about science is you can't prove something to be true. You can generally prove something only to be false, but like Sherlock Holmes, you... You, you get rid of all the false stuff, and what's left over is true. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have to say to me one of the misconceptions of science, uh, can you say some of them? Uh, I think I can try to make a point that there is a notion that science is a matter of opinion, and we have to hear all sides of the story. And yeah, yeah. Well, as I often like to say, and so the great thing about science in some, is that in one, in science, one side is usually wrong. The difference is that. That there are open questions where 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 um, where there's uncertainty and debate, but the 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 the, the resolver of of debates is not is not uh, rhetoric or 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 volume, but rather nature. So that if you have um, an idea and you go out and measure it and it simply disagrees with observation, then you throw it out. There's no discussion. There's no need to debate the question of whether the earth is round or whether it's flat. You might, you might, um, there are still people who claim the earth is flat, but they're just simply wrong. You don't have to, as a journalist, you don't have to quote them. Similarly, about evolution, there's you know, people who somehow don't think evolution happened, but they're wrong. And I would have to say the same thing about the fact that the climate is, that human induced climate change is happening. Those people who argue against it are simply wrong. Yeah. Uh you made a point recently that the only knowledge that matters is the empirical one, and I I agree with you on that. I mean, can you elaborate? Well, I, I don't know the only knowledge that matters. I think the only knowledge. I think um, the only. Uh, I don't understand when people say that they can get knowledge by revelation. Um, you that just simply leads to delusion. You need to be able to. We we all, in fact, delude ourselves on a daily basis. We need to we need to be skeptical of ourselves and the way and we need to test things and I don't see any um, uh, I cannot see any uh, I can see reflection and maybe even wisdom but knowledge comes from observation and testing and experiment and um, there's no anyone who claims to have knowledge otherwise um, first of all can't demonstrate it. And secondly, uh, it's likely to be wrong. Yeah, you, you make a point that uh, in this course of science, uh, we do not learn how the universe was by logic. And, and... Yeah, I mean, the point is that we, you know, classical logic suggests is based, you know, on, on what seems reasonable. But what seems reasonable to us is based on our experience. And as we broaden our experience, what seems reasonable can change. And quantum mechanics is the perfect example. Um, it doesn't seem reasonable for it to be able to be in two places at once, but at the quantum mechanical world, that's what happens. So you, 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 based on observation, you can do carefully 
reasoned logical arguments, but to presume in advance what is logical or to use classic, classical logic, one has to be very careful because the world isn't classical. What do you mean by that? The world is not classical. Well, I mean that there are, we, as 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 Richard Dawkins has said, and I like to repeat that, you know, we we evolved with our sense of logic and reason to escape lions on the savanna in Africa, not to understand quantum mechanics. And um, on the very small and the very large, the universe behaves in a way which seems paradoxical to us. And it is paradoxical to us because we are, we, our intuition is based on a, on a small segment of reality. And um, that segment doesn't apply universally and we have to be very careful not to do so. Science teaches us that our myopic views don't necessarily represent all of reality and we have to be very careful to assume that what we think is either natural or sensible is really the case. Uh, I think one of the, the another people say that science changes is all the time, has been changing all the time and they, they say this is a, a bad thing for science. And I, well, I mean, first of all, science does change. It's called progress. Um, but but it changes in a very well-defined way. It's not as if that we throw out what went before us. That's a, another big misunderstanding of science. What what has satisfied the test of experiment will always survive. So even Newton's laws, which have been supplanted by general relativity and quantum mechanics, on the scale in which they apply for the motions of cannonballs, baseballs, uh, missiles against Syria, whatever you want to do, um, they, the, the, Newton's laws are, will always apply. And so we may learn new things at the edges of knowledge. In fact, we always will, which is what makes science wonderful, that change our underlying picture of things. But, but there's a constancy in our ability to predict. It's not as if we threw out what went before. Uh, and you, you've been so, uh, like me, uh, in a sense, a uh, critic of, of, of philosophy in this process of science. And can you talk about that, please? About what again? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Philosophy. How? How? I mean, I, I, yesterday I, I watched your debate on on Stockholm, and I honestly I got a lot, lot of times, I, and I agree with you almost all your points you make. Uh, our points, to be honest. And, and well, I, I mean, look, I, I like to be a little more charitable for philosophers than maybe I am in debates because it's a fun to, to make fun of them. But but the point is, philosophy is useful to reflect on the knowledge that's generated by science, and all the good philosophers I know. Do that. They use rigorous logic and reason to reflect on the knowledge and 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 interpret, and then ask new questions. So philosophy is sometimes useful for framing questions, but science is what's useful for coming up with answers and for generating that knowledge. And and I think I think any any philosopher who argues otherwise is uh, overstating the case. And as I say. I have many friends who are philosophers, and I think um, we all agree that that's what philosophy is good for. It used to be, I mean, let's face it, it used to be indistinguishable from physics back in the days when natural philosophy was the case, but the two have diverged. And, um, and philosophy just simply doesn't, isn't the right way to generate knowledge about the world. It's the way to reflect upon that knowledge. All right, and uh, you talk about that people have notions that the word is different from science, like theory or even nothing. And let's talk about a little, a little on that. Uh, what is theory for science and, and why people keep getting wrong? Well, I mean, you're right. I, you know, in science, we use various terms that have very different meaning than in the popular parlance. And, and to be honest, one of my problems in having conversation about science is that all the time I'm asking what people about, about by each word. And well, it's, it's true. It's a problem. I mean, science is... As T.S. Eliot said, the language is slippery and words slip through and, you know, that's why science is done mathematically because it's more precise. But, but theory in science is the highest level of knowledge. It's, it's, it's not a hypothesis. A theory, like the theory of gravi Newton's theory of universal gravity or the quantum theory, is, is, is a mathematical supposition that has been subject to test over and over again. And so when we say evolution is a theory, it's putting on on the highest possible pedestal, yeah. not suggesting it's some random hypothesis. Let, let, let me jump a little bit on that. I, I think it's an article that you written uh, a while back that said that 
uh, string theory is not a theory in the same sense that evolution is a theory. So, I mean, uh, empirically, I know that theory is the highest level, but but I know... Uh, scientists are human beings, and they misuse words like anyone else. And I now, I'm very pleased to say that I've convinced people like Brian Greene, who's a friend of mine, that he's absolutely, that he agrees with me now, and of course he doesn't quote me, um, that uh, that string theory isn't a theory. It's not a theory. It's not... It shouldn't be called a theory, but you know, uh, it's easy to lapse into. Uh, okay, uh, I think a good question now is what kind of other theories has been called a theory and, and, and it's not a theory yet? And that's a very good in, in physics, for example. Well, in physics is where I can I can speak most clearly. Um, well, I think uh, you know string theory is one good example, but I think there are others. Uh, well, look, well. For example, uh, all these attempts to make uh, uh, gravity, uh, ice and gravity, and, and quantum mechanics, look for quantum gravity. Can you be ca can call it theory? Not, we call it a theory. No, we, uh, you know. we, we call it, but we, in the same sense you call evolution theory, can you call it a theory? I mean, something that has been predicted and tested? Well, except we can't test our predictions about quantum gravity, so we don't yet have a theory of quantum gravity. There are lots of theories we don't have, but one clear example is the theory of quantum gravity. We don't yet have a theory of what happens at the center and singularity of black holes. We don't yet have a theory of what happened at t equals zero in the Big Bang. We have ideas, but we can't have been able to test them. Um, and and some people would argue that uh, uh, complexity is a theory, complexity theory. And I'm not convinced that it really there's really a theoretical under, underpinning of complexity. Right, but but when you say string theory uh, doesn't make it isn't theory because it doesn't make any predictions yet, or because the predictions it make it's not falsifiable at this moment. Well, string theory it's is both. It doesn't really make any predictions at this point, and it, and and because it's still an evolving idea, and every time people make predictions, they realize that they're probably premature. But the predictions it could make are probably beyond the realm of experiment, although smart. Theorists continually try and think of ways that we might be able to test the ideas, like the existence of extra dimensions, for example. There's a small possibility we might be able to test it at, at the Large Hadron Collider, but it's a very small possibility indeed. Right. And, and what do you mean by the universe comes from nothing on your last book? I mean that it's plausible, given everything we know and every measurement we've made about the universe, that it could come from nothing, no space, no time, no particles, no radiation. In particular, if you ask what would be the characteristics of a universe that did come from nothing by the known laws of physics and some reasonable extrapolations of the known laws of physics, it would, it would have the characteristics of our universe. Yeah, but, but, but on your book, you make, and in your lectures, you make the three levels of nothing. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, the point is that, it, that, again, nothing like theory is a word that means different things to different people. And as I often like to say, the people who don't like what I say define nothing as that from which only God can create something. But, um, but you know, for many people, nothingness was the infinite void of the Bible. The empty space was nothing. But, of course, that's not nothing. And we show that. And then, and then um, or that kind of nothing can easily create something. I mean, that is that can be defined as nothing. Empty space is a good approximation, but it's really much more complex than our naive picture is. But then uh, then I say that a more dramatic version of nothing involves not only no particles and no radiation, but no space itself. And that, that again, could come into existence if by any reasonable theory of quantum gravity. And then the final version of nothing is to say, well, maybe even the laws themselves that govern how things evolve in our universe themselves are accidental. So you have no, that's the ultimate version with no laws, no space, no time, no matter, no radiation. Well, you know, maybe that's not nothing, but it's pretty good nothing to me. To me too. And I, I have a, a question on quantum mechanics. I mean, uh, you talk about quantum teleportation, quantum entanglement, and, and, and you say they can have two particles and one with you, one with me, and their superposition state. And, and if I look at the particle, the others with, the, with you, we will change it to the other state. But how can I know that empirically? Because if I do the, the, the testing, I change the superposition state. So, and and the, the, the question is, how can I, I know that if the particle is in another galaxy, that still applies? Well, we, we, well we, we don't know it still applies in another galaxy, but we've done the empirical tests over many kilometers. Ah, okay. 
and many kilometers and a million kilometers are the same thing as far as quantum mechanics is concerned. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and the, uh, I'm not sure you know, I'm a computer scientist. And, uh, oh. uh, quantum computing, what's, what's the, 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 the interesting about I mean, I've got a fascinated idea, oh, but, but... Quantum computers are, are fascinating, but the point is that quantum computers could, would allow you to do certain algorithms that classically you cannot do, such as factor large prime numbers. I mean, lar factor large numbers into their prime in, into prime numbers. They all, all every number has a unique expression in terms of a product of primes, and very large numbers cannot um, easily be the the primes that they're a product of cannot easily be determined. Now, um, uh, uh, that algorithm is possible with quantum computers. Now, why should we care? Well, it turns out that people use large numbers and their prime factors as keys for the security of credit cards and bank accounts. And so if you could factor them easily, then we'd have to find other ways to ensure security. That's the bad news. The good news, however, is that quantum computers can also provide quantum encryption and, and in a sense, allow you to see if someone has been eavesdropping in on a message. So there's a plus and minus for using quantum mechanics. If we ever could, and it's not clear that we can practically do it. I think the, the, the reason that we can do is because something called quantum decoherence, it, it, I'm correct. In general, that's right. It, it, the quantum world is generally invisible for, because, for good reason, because the, the, the interactions of particles within the environment destroy quantum correlations. And it's precisely those quantum correlations you want to exploit to do either quantum computing or quantum teleportation or anything like that. Uh, I wanted to question you now about uh, Science and morality, I think it's a very interesting and, and topic that you make very good comments. I mean, you said that without science, we a moral is, is almost useless. How do you opinion on that? What's your opinion on that? Uh, I, again, I, I just missed the end there. I'm sorry. Try, uh, okay. Try. Uh, I said about science and morality, and you make some point that without science, our morals are empty. So. Well, I do. I think that everyone's, I mean, everyone who claims that the morality is based on religion is actually basing the morality on reason. Um, as I often say to people, if you didn't believe in God, you probably still wouldn't go out and kill your neighbor, uh, although some people say they would. But um, uh, the point is that science tells us the consequences of our actions. And if we don't know the consequences of our actions, we can't even determine what's right and wrong. And then... And then we use reason, empirical evidence for the consequences of our actions, and then reason based on it to, um, um, uh, to then determine what, what's appropriate. And most people operate that way, and that's what the laws of most nations are based on, not on some religious doctrines, but on, on reason and, and empirical evidence. And as Steven Pinker put it, uh, you know, you can ask, how does God know? What's right or wrong? There's two possibilities. One is he invents them arbitrarily, in which case, what's the point of worrying about that? Or two, he bases what's right or wrong on what's reasonable. But if he does, then we can just get rid of the of the middleman and just go directly to the reason ourselves. Yeah, can, can, I mean, uh, I think Sam Harris made the point that there is objective moral. Do, do you think there is an objective moral? Well, I think that there are universal morals in the sense that people are biologically hardwired to think certain things are wrong, like, for example, a priori, most people find um, incest uh, repulsive. But there are biological reasons for that. But I don't think there are objective morals. I don't think, um, I don't think, I think that, that, that the morality, morality is determined contextually within the context of a framework of a time and certain circumstances. And as I say, in certain circumstances, incest isn't wrong, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not that it isn't wrong. Let me make it quite clear. In certain circumstances, it's not obvious that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, uh, what about uh, and science and, and free will? We have to talk about. I mean, you, you said that quantum mechanics, is, the laws of quantum mechanics are deterministic, but I, I wanted to clarify that because what about the probabilities and distribution of probabilities of quantum mechanics? But it's still deterministic? Well, the underlying equations are second-order differential equations, which are deterministic. You give an initial set of conditions, and you can derive an unambiguous... But, but, uh, but, but the derivation of it... it, it hold on, hold on. Let me just finish. Oh, the, right. wave function, the wave function evolves deterministically. 
That's so the underlying physics evolves deterministically. It's absolutely true that effectively, from a point of view of observation and experiment, things are probabilistic. But the underlying laws are deterministic. And, and what about uh, uh, you, free will? Is, I mean, there has been very, very tough people comments about science and free will. And, and science and what? Free will. I mean, well, free, will. free will. Oh, uh, oh I think it's on. I think free will is is an illusion, but it's so. But you know, it's an effective illusion. We live in a world that, for all intents and purposes, behaves like a world in which we have free will. So it's essentially indistinguishable from a world with free will, and so therefore. Um, the question of whether it really exists or not is one of those irrelevant questions. We behave as if we have free will. Okay, and uh, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about religion that uh, some people, I think, uh, do not understand that. You need to make these comments clear that saying God is, is, is an explanation for something is a cop out. And, and Yes. And elaborate a little on that. And my question to you is a little more, uh, I think, when people propose God, they propose something that is a that is more complex than the entity you're trying to explain, and I think there is not an explanation. Well, I, you know, people mean many different things by what God, because God is not well defined. Everyone invents their own gods. And so I think that, that when people use the term God, it's a very personal term, and it means many different things, and as I say, it's ill-defined, not least because it's an illusion. And, and the, the, there is some scientists that do believe in God, and but yes, yeah, but they don't believe because of any scientific. No, well, some of them say that when they look at the world around them, the beauty, the wonder, the organization, all of that tells them that there's some higher purpose. Well, that's fine that they can think that, but there's no evidence of it. Right, but well, it, scientists yeah. are like other human beings, and they can hold contradictory views at the same time, and um, uh, and um. Therefore, you know, as I often say, some scientists are Republicans. I can't understand it, but, you know. Yeah, but, but uh, if, if you, some, some people try to make the, the, the case that science and religion are compatible because there are some scientists that are religious people. Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, there are scientists, as I say, there are scientists who could hold mutually contradictory beliefs. And those scientists become atheists when they go in the laboratory. And they stop being atheists when they go out of the laboratory. So... So, so if you can ignore everything you believe in one circumstance, then absolutely they're compatible. And let me point it out. A vague belief in some order in the universe and, and purpose is not incompatible with science. There's no evidence of it, but it's not incompatible. But the tenets of the world's major religions are incompatible with science. The, the, the scriptures are, are incompatible, and, and therefore... Uh, uh, they're incompatible with evidence and our, our current knowledge. And so some vague deism is compatible with science, but certainly not uh, belief in any of the world's major religions. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure if there's a prevalence and difference of believing. Here in Brazil, I think it's common, the religion called spiritism by the Bezon Karbeck. And what, what pissed me off of them is because they call themselves a science. That, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure how common it is in the United States, but... Uh, they call keeping calling themselves a science, but and and I, as far as I know, I mean, after life, it, it exists of ghosts, contradictions of the laws of thermodynamics. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, yeah. I mean, there's lots of reasons ghosts and an afterlife could contradict science and reincarnation does, which is why Buddhism, which some of my colleagues like Sam Harris seem to be enamored with Buddhism, it's just as silly as uh, as the rest, as far as I'm concerned. But 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 this this well, you said the reincarnation contradicts with science. But what, what exactly the point of science is reincarnation contradicted? Well, I, I talk about it in one of my books called um, uh, um, uh, Beyond Star Trek. But it it it, it, it contradicts uh, science, it, not least in the sense that there are more people alive now than there were essentially almost all over the sum of human history. So if you're going to move around bodies, you've got the counting doesn't work. All right. Uh, you make it also the, the 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 comment that why and how question. That's one of the key things I keep you that religion answers the why and science deals with the how. And that's that's bullshit. Um, uh, religion doesn't deal with anything. But but what do you mean by why? If you ask why, you presume purpose. So religion presumes purpose and then presumes to answer it. 
But the presumption of purpose is a presumption. And therefore, um, un unless you've established that there is evidence of purpose, you're inventing things. And that's why religion invents things. Okay. Uh, in, in, in your book, you said that you're not sympathetic with the idea of a creator, of creation. And, and... Yeah, I, I don't like the idea of a creator, but that doesn't, my likes or dislikes are irrelevant, but it's true. I'm, I happen to find the idea distasteful. And, and religious people like to, 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 to say that finding the of the universe as a, as a point for them. And yeah, well, they don't know about the. They don't understand what they're talking about. Once again, it's like the old claim that bees were fine-tuned to see the colors of flowers means they were designed. But no, if they couldn't see the colors of flowers, they wouldn't get nectar, and they wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to 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 reproduce. Um, there, our universe, our we, our characteristics seem to be such that they're fine-tuned to the universe in which we live, which the, can put the other way around, suggesting the universe seems to be fine-tuned for us. That could just be an accident. We evolved in this universe. If we'd evolved in another universe, our characteristics might be different, first of all. Secondly, the universe isn't fine-tuned for life. Most of the universe is quite inhospitable for life. And, and the universe is trying to kill us all the time. Thirdly, it actually isn't even fine-tuned. There are, there are constants that could be much more natural and that would make life even better that, that aren't. So all of those arguments are, are based on, on a lack of understanding of fine-tuning. Okay. I'm going to have to go in a, in a, in a minute or two. Okay, uh, what about Unbelievers? That is, uh, 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 to Brazil, uh, do you know something that is going to be released here in Brazil? Oh, the Unbelievers. No, I, I would love to be able to tell you. We're, we're in the final stages of negotiation of the distribution. It will get worldwide distribution in 2014. Okay. It will be in, theaters in some theaters in the United States in 2013. And it, will get, it may get theatrical distribution in each country. It will certainly get distribution on... Amazon and Netflix and, and video on demand and that sort of thing and DVD. Whether it gets theatrical distribution will depend on on uh, negotiations with each country that I'm not a party to. All right. Uh, do you have any plans for next book? I do, but I'm not going to tell you about them. Okay. And if someone in Brazil uh, wants to translate one of your books, what it needs to do? They need to contact Simon and Schuster, my publishers. Uh, and they can contact uh, you know me, and I can give them the the Leslie Meredith is my editor, but 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 Simon and Schuster is the publishers of of the, oh, well if it's, if it's a universe from nothing, if it's different books, they have to contact the publishers of those different books. Um, and um, yeah, because one of the problems that I see here in Brazil is that we don't have, I mean to to make the point, the fear of physics we have it, but it's sold out. There's no I I didn't find any copies of. It. I I do the search. I have the books in in original. I do the search just to. Uh, well, how, I, how bad some, are. I know some of my books are translated into Portuguese, and 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 uh, and there there are several because I've done interviews in Brazil with some of on some of my books, maybe the physics of Star Trek. Um, I'd love it if they were all translated. Yeah, but the universe for nothing is not translated, as far as I know, and the only one that I can find is Sphere for Physics. Well, the universe for nothing may not be translated yet. I think there may be an arrangement. Universe for nothing already has negotiated deals to. Be translated into 21 languages. I think Portuguese is one of them, and I'm not certain. All right. But check, check. I I I, oh, I try to check looking the the stories and online stories, and, and, and the only one that I can find is, is is fear physics, but it's always sold out. Uh, I mean, that has been a long time ago. that will be available, and now it's not anymore. I'm sorry. I wish I could do something to yeah. help. I would, especially since I'd love it if my book sold more there. So. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. I want to, to thank you very much for your time and kindness. Thank, thank and good interview. Good luck to you in it. And so, of course, send me whatever you do about uh, it, okay? I'm going to put it on YouTube and, and send to you, if that okay. Okay, no can, problem. Can I make it public directly? Can you what? Can I make it the, the video public in YouTube directly? Well, I'd like to at least see the quality of the video, if you wouldn't mind linking it. Oh, no, okay, it. okay. It's fine. All right, I put it on YouTube and send a link to you and private. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.